Okay. Um, before we get officially started with the content, um, I just wanted to do a few quick announcements. Um, so first, I just wanted to check in and say I hope everyone is doing okay. And um, this is a tough and scary time, and we weren't really expecting this. So I know it can feel even worse when um, when you're unprepared. And you know, we just hope you're all right. Everyone's healthy and safe, and we miss those kiddos so much and can't wait to see them again. Um, Number two on my announcements is that, you know, keeping that in mind that we weren't prepared. Um, if there's anything that your family needs, um, as far as like clothing, food, uh, you know, whatever you need. If you are lacking something that you feel like would make your life better, please reach out to Sarah Dooley and we will do whatever we can to get you connected with those resources. Um, so please don't feel like you're on your own. Um, and then the third one is just a request that I have. Um, as we learn how to do this distance learning stuff together, um, you know, please give us your feedback on what is helpful, um, what topics you would like to see, training you want, how to's, anything like that. Um, the better or the more you give us, the more information, uh, the better we can serve you. Because we're all kind of just learning this together right now. All right. With those announcements out of the way, I'm going to begin. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brittany Leggett. I'm one of the BCBAs at Sarah Dooley. Um, I've been in the field for over 12 years, and uh, I've been at Sarah Dooley for over three years. If you uh, haven't met me before, it's probably because my job is largely behind the scenes. Um, my role is to support the teachers and the students, and unless there's something kind of big or abnormal going on um, with your particular uh, child, then you probably don't interact with me too much, except maybe at arrival and dismissal. So you might recognize me, you might not, that's okay. I'm here. I know all of our kids. I know them all well. Do my best to uh, see them all every day while we're in session. And I, you know, do my best to make sure we have really good working relationships. Um, I love all your kids. All right. So that said, we're going to talk today about, um, Visual schedules and token boards. This was one of the topics we wanted to give you first because uh, most of our kids at Sarah Dooley are using these visual supports and aids already. And by uh, carrying that over to use in the home, it might make this transition time a little easier on everyone. Um, just having something familiar that they understand the structure of could really help. Um, all right, so. Just to give you a quick idea of uh, what they can help with, visual schedules and token boards um, can help with creating new routines. Or if you have a routine but you need to build in some new steps because you know we all have new normals, um, you can do that with these. Working on transitions because we all know transitions are hard for our kiddos. Um, completing activities or you know seeing something through till it's actually done, and then learning new skills. Uh, my objectives for the webinar um, are to describe what these tools are to you, um, to describe some ways that visual schedules and token boards can be used in the home to create more structure. Um, I want to identify how they can be used together to support each other and um, give you things to consider if you decide to use them in the home and then give you some resources at the end. Um, I really want you to be able to just use this information to create whatever kind of thing is going to work for your family. Every family has unique needs and these are tools that are very adaptable and can be able to be modified um, easily for any client um, in any family. All right, so we're first going to start with visual schedules. Um, these are just some quick examples I wanted to throw up here just to give you a frame of reference um, as we talk about them, but you know, don't worry about looking at them too closely. I'm going to give you uh, slide by slide some more detailed pictures. Um, these are some examples of visual schedules that break down a larger task into single steps. So for example, the one my mouse is on right now, this is a toileting schedule that they break down into steps. Uh, the middle one is brushing teeth, and then the last one is uh, like a recipe. I think it's making those dirt and worm pudding cups kids like. <laughs> um, 
And on this page, we've got some visual schedules that are less breaking down the steps of a single activity and more when you have more than one activity that you're going to be doing. Um, so the first one where my mouse is, is one where you've got multiple activities. You've got a to-do column. You can move them over to all done. The next one is sort of a, a first then, but you have multiple activities you have to get through to get to the then. And then the last one is sort of a more advanced version, and it's kind of more like what you or I would use, uh, sort of a to-do list um, with checkboxes. And um, that's, that's something you might be able to use if you have a learner who is um, a reader writer. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about what visual schedules are. Don't worry about reading every single word on this slide or trying to take notes. I'm going to go into each of these bullets in detail after this. I just wanted there to be sort of a comprehensive list. Um, I do intend to send out or have available if you want it, these slides um, in case you want to go back and reference anything. Um, so uh, the only thing I want you to attend to, oops, I moved on. The only thing I want you to attend to right here is uh, the little asterisk at the bottom. Visual schedules can be pictures or text or both. Um, I want you to just know that it can be whatever works for your family and your child. Um, I might be showing you visuals or examples that have just one or the other, uh, but know that if you've got a child who uses picture exchange to communicate, you probably just want to use pictures and you don't even need to worry about the text. Or if you have someone who is learning to read, you probably want to have the pictures there to rely on and then have the words there too so that they become more familiar with it and learn how to read those. Um, and then if you see someone who's a reader writer already, you can just use text. You don't need those, those pictures. Um, so just keep that in mind. It can be whatever works for your family. Um, okay, so visual schedules are a visual support that can be used to provide an expectation or understanding on what tasks or activities are to be completed. Basically, it's going to show the learner um, some way, whether that's through pictures or text or both, uh, what needs to be done and what they should expect. It's just a reference tool, really. Okay. Um, visual schedules can also provide signals for transitions. Um, we know that for a lot of our kiddos, uh, transitions can be hard things, especially if they are doing something that they really enjoy and someone walks in and says, okay, fun's done, it's time to do chores or something like that. Um, that's going to be a really tough transition for them. So by proactively showing them ahead of time, hey, after this happens, then we're going to do this, they've already kind of had that expectation set up and it's a little less painful for them if they're expecting it. Um, I'm going to go into more depth on how to use them for transitions when we get to the part where visual schedules are working together with token boards. So I will come back to this, um, this concept. Um, I'm going to show you some examples next as I go through. Um, just be thinking about, you know, what you feel like would work for your child. Um, there might be multiple ones that you feel like can work at different times. That's fine. Um, you, you know your child best, you're the absolute expert on them, and uh, you're probably going to know right away which ones you want to use, but if you want to reach out to uh, their classroom teacher, I do recommend doing that. If you want to be super consistent and have the most familiar materials, we'll be able to send you ones that you can replicate the exact same thing they use at school. All right, so here's an example of a visual schedule that has multiple activities that will be completed in that sequence or that order um, in which they're shown. So in this example, uh, this is a pretty common one um, that you see in the school setting. It's laminated and Velcroed, and um, you can move them over to all done after you do them. Um, obviously, <laughs> lamination and Velcro are not your typical household inventory item. So if you don't have those, that's totally okay. You can create one by hand. Um, use real photos, print out a Word doc, you know, whatever works for you. Um, it's really not in how, of like, what it's made of, but more in how you use it uh, that's going to matter. So don't stress too much over what it looks like. Um, I went ahead and made an example, I hope you can see, where I just kind of drew in the to-dos. Um, I've got get dressed, eat breakfast, wash dishes, go outside. And over here, I put this in, like, just a page protector. So I can use my dry erase marker and check when it's all done. Sorry, my marker isn't. There we go. 
because it's super dark. Um, so there's lots of different ways and low tech ways that you can do this in the home. It doesn't have to be like a perfect little image that gets Velcroed and laminated and all that. Um, I want to take a second or a few seconds to show you, let me move my screen over, um, a little video of this uh, is one I'm going to link to later for your resource. Um, because it's a really great example of a parent that's setting up um, a visual schedule for their, their child in the home. But this is just a little clip of him using it and what that can look like as you start to train your child to use a visual schedule. So, Emma, you're all dressed. Go ahead and check your schedule. Remember, you, remember get dressed goes on the back of the schedule? Check. No. Nope, not a school day today. Not All right. a school day. What's the next thing on your schedule after get dressed? Um, hand washing. That's right. Then eat. Then brush your plate. Then toothbrush. Okay. So. That's a super cute example of someone um, teaching their son to use their visual schedule. Um, and in that one, I like the example because he's obviously been exposed to it before and has some level of expectation with it, but he's still very much learning to use it. Um, you notice how mom had to prompt him, kind of, oh, remember to put it on the back when it's all done. And, oh, what's next? We don't just walk away after the schedule it, piece gets put on the back. We have more schedule to do. So that was a pretty um, realistic example of what training on those can look like. Um, I have another example here for you of a multiple activities in a sequence. So these are really nice when you have a routine you're trying to build too. Um, so for example, your nighttime routine, um, it's gonna go in a specific order because for example, you wouldn't put your pajamas on before your bath because then you just have to undo and redo that stuff. Um, so it's gonna go in order bath, dry off, brush teeth, pajamas, and story. Um, so sh showing and following this with consistency um, can help to create that new routine. And over time, you'll probably be able to fade at least your guidance of it and that just that visual prompt being there might be enough for them to kind of go through the motions after repeated practice on their own. Um, another thing to keep in mind with this type of visual schedule, you definitely want to try to make sure the thing on the end is something they want to get to. Um, so most of the time, uh, kids are reinforced by that whole uh, bedtime story thing before going to bed. So you notice that the, at the end, we do kind of the things that are less fun, like nobody likes brushing their teeth or, you know, things like that. Uh, but if I want to get to the story, I got to finish the other stuff. So it just adds that inherent motivation to the sequence. Um, the next type of visual schedule I'm going to show you is a first then visual. Um, first then visuals are task and reward visuals, which create the expectation for earning by using what is motivating to the student. So they can be used during any activity in which your child is doing something which they would not choose to be doing in order to gain access to something they do want or want to be doing. Um, so in this example here on the first end board, I've got first eat your lunch, then get your gummies. Um, that's a pretty natural one. First eat your dinner, then you get your dessert. Um, or the Pink Floyd principle, first eat your meat, then get your pudding or however it goes. Um, and, you know, you can use this in a lot of different ways. The sky's the limit. Um, I know I personally use this one a lot. Clean up your toys then tablet time, so first clean up toys, then tablet time on my daughter, um, or things like first put on your shoes, then play outside. Um, the thing to keep in mind here, you can use just about anything. The then box just has to be something that they want. If it's not the fun thing that they want, and you've just got two tasks that they don't wanna do, they're probably not gonna go ahead and do those for you. So the first will get done if they want the then. First thens are definitely kind of the foundation of a lot of things that we do here or at Fairly. Um, 
Okay, so when should you use a first then? Like I said before, you want to use this anytime someone is asked to do something they don't want to be doing or wouldn't choose to be doing in order to get that thing that they do want to be doing. Um, some learners might only be ready for a first then, so just keep that in mind. Um, if your child doesn't have a high tolerance for demands and earning scenarios yet, you may want to only start with first bends um, until they build up some tolerance and are able to be a little better at waiting and doing their tasks before they get the reward, before you start adding multiple activities onto that schedule. Because if it's really hard to get through one, a first bend is probably all you need. Um, the next one is um, just a checklist. And this is an example of one you might use if your child is a little more independent and can handle some responsibility um, and that the things that you want them to do don't necessarily have to be completed in order. Um, so just a there's a line for the to do task and a box to check it off. Um, just like the example I showed you before of the multiple things to do. It's just got to check. Um, this one could be as simple as you know, writing a list and having them cross it off or doing a check at the end. Um, it's a really low tech version, but it kind of depends on your um, learner being a reader um, and having a little more independence and in getting those tasks done. Um, and you'll see at the bottom, this one has your first then equivalent. It says, when I finish my to-do list, I have free time. Um, so we always want to make sure that that little what can be earned is built in there. Um, the last type of visual schedule that I'm going to show you is a step-by-step -step breakdown of a bigger chain or routine. Um, this can help, help with activities like brushing teeth, and that's the example I've got here on the screen, um, or bathing, doing laundry, uh, other chores, those things that are sort of a step-by-step -step task that don't really change what the steps are each time. That's a, that's a good kind of thing to use this for. Um, to use this kind of step-by-step -step visual, you want to keep it posted in the area where it will be used for, um, or where you're going to use it, basically. So for this example of uh, brushing teeth, you're going to post that list up next to the bathroom sink. And then um, your child might need help, and you know, help attending, have you point to each step as you go. Um, but eventually, you might be able to fade your guidance and prompting, and they might just, you know, attend to the list themselves and be able to do it. Um, I still have this example. Uh, my, my child is toilet trained, but um, I still have this in my downstairs bathroom. So I thought it was a good one to show where when I was teaching her how to use the toilet, um, we had a little uh, visual schedule for that where it was go, sit. Um, I really focused on the poop because that was the one she had a problem with. Sorry for the overshare. Uh, wipe, flush, and then wash your hands. So we practice this all the time. I really had to make her go step by step in the beginning, but eventually she followed it herself and she thought it was pretty fun. Um, so that's just an example. Um, so when should you use this type of visual schedule that breaks it down into steps? Um, these are going to be best used for things that happen in a specific place and that there are pretty routine and the steps always happen in roughly the same order. So at Sarah Dooley, we use this type of schedule a lot for things like toileting, hand washing, brushing teeth, um, and chores kind of skills like washing dishes, doing laundry, stuff like that. Um, these translate really nicely to the home too, and since they're familiar, that helps. Um, again, just like the other visual schedules and token boards, if you want to reach out to your child's teacher and ask for the exact um, resources that we are using at school, that will help with the consistency and continuity. All right. Um, next, we're going to talk about token boards. I'm not completely done with visual schedules, but I'll come back and tie them in after um, I've shown you token boards because the two definitely work together nicely. Um, so just like before, here are some examples. I just want you to have a frame of reference um, as we move forward, and I'll talk about those more in depth as we go. So what is a token board? Tokens get exchanged like money for items and activities that your child wants. Um, this is where we get like that big motivation piece that's very important to get them to even bother to try to do what we're asking them to do. Um, so every time you're about to do work, 
um, and before you start a token board, um, you want to figure out what it is that your child wants to earn. So find that motivator. Um, so for some students, that might be just asking them, hey, what do you want to earn? And others, you might have to lay out your options um, and let them pick. But once you know what that is, then you're able to start earning in this structured way that's going to help them get to their reward. Um, tokens get awarded for correct answers and good behavior. Um, so good behavior uh, is kind of vague and in the home that can be different things. So it might be things like staying in your seat while we're doing some tabletop work or it might be things like not running away. Uh, patience, flexibility, just effort, like even if they're not getting the answers right or not doing things perfectly, if you see them really trying, go ahead and reinforce that. Give them some praise and a reward. Um, and being safe. Um, so tokens will get handed over for any time they're doing exactly what you ask and they're correct and they're learning and they're engaged and then as well as those other good things that you want to reinforce and praise them for. Uh, the token board itself will provide a visual representation of how much work is required before they get to their reward. So um, they can kind of see their progress and how close they are and how much work they have left. Once all the tokens are earned and they've been placed on the board, the reward is given. Um, and that's a pretty immediate thing. You're not going to add on other things to do there. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples in a minute of token boards, but just thinking like these can be easily made with things around your house. Um, I know a lot of parents are familiar with sticker charts. Um, if you have color markers, stamps, stickers, like these are things you can use to make tokens pretty easy. Um, I'm going to show you another quick video just of a child earning some tokens. Um, just so you can see, like, for a practice learner, this is how quick and easy this can look. All right, Ava, come work with me. Let's sit down, please. Good job. Thank you for listening. Good job, Ava. Ava, today we're going to work on your letters. We're going to do letters first. And what are we working for? Ava, what are we look, working for? Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig on your tablet. Okay. So, Ava, Ava, we're going to practice letters, and every time you get one right, you can put a star on your caterpillar. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Show me ready. Awesome. Good job. I like Peppa I know you do. Ava, show me B. Awesome. High five. Put a star on your caterpillar. Great. Good job, Eva. Have a seat. Awesome. Eva. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to show you the end. You got it. Good job, Eva. You got all of your stars. What do you get now? Peppa. Peppa Pig on your tablet. Good job. Come here. Okay. Sorry. Let me get back to my slide. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, so that was just a cute, super cute example of a little girl um, who's obviously familiar with tokens and has a good history with them. And, um, you know, really once it clicks um, that, hey, this is how I get my reward, students buy in really quickly. So it can be as quick and simple as that. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer to earn a token, but if it's taking very long, you just want to throw those in for like, oh, but you're staying in your seat too, and you know, kind of give them a freebie for other good stuff they're doing. Um, when should you use token boards? So token boards can be used with learners who are able to tolerate multiple demands before they get their reward. Um, and someone who has a grasp on the visual concept of finishing the board or filling all the boxes, if you know, that's too long to wait or that visual representation doesn't yet have context or make sense for them, they might not be ready for a token board. And that's okay. Um, if your learner is not ready for tokens and has no history of using them, then it's okay to give them small amounts of what they're earning instead of that token. So every one to two correct answers or good behavior, you could give them a Skittle or a half a gummy, or uh, 10 seconds of a video, or something like that, rather than tokens to get the larger amount. Um, like I said before, you're the expert on your child, so you're going to know what works and how much they can kind of get done. Um, but 
knowing whether or not you know this would make sense for them is definitely up to you. So here are some examples of token boards, um, which are pretty pretty easy to replicate on paper. The I am working for piece can either be in addition to um, the visual first then or substitute it. It just depends on if your student is a reader or not. Um, so I made a quick example that could easily be on paper. Uh, I had a whiteboard handy though. So first clean up toys, then TV. Um, that's my first then. And then I've got all the spots where if my daughter was cleaning up her toys, I would kind of give her a check for maybe every one to two toys she picks up or more likely every area of the room because the toys get everywhere and they're tiny. And then once she's cleaned up enough and I feel satisfied, um, we're going to get to that last one and then she's going to get TV. And then even if the room didn't get clean, if the test didn't get finished, I can still let her have that TV time, give her an amount like five or 10 minutes. And then after that, we can start the board again and just earn it over so that the room actually gets cleaned. Um, let's see, if you're doing something that's on the easier side, something that uh, your child does a lot and is pretty good at, you can put more tokens on there. Um, and if you're doing something that's harder for them, maybe something they don't like doing, um, or something that's brand new and you're not sure how much they'll tolerate it yet, you can put less tokens on there. So when you're doing it on paper or a dry erase, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, that being said, we have some learners who benefit from having a very structured token system. Um, maybe they aren't ready yet for the flexibility and need that kind of consistent um, token board in order to help them grasp that there is an earning contingency in place. So sometimes for some learners using the exact same token board with the exact same tokens and the same amount every time is the best way to approach it. If you feel like your student needs that, that much consistency, that's something you could either make or reach out to the teacher so you can get the same copy they're using at school. Um, so these are just some examples. Most of the time, these are for younger learners um, that are just learning how to use the token system. And we usually try to make them fun and thematic. The tokens might be their favorite characters from their favorite cartoon or something like that, because you want it to be something they, they want to interact with. Um, and you definitely would want a first then picture to go with that as well. Um, okay, so next I'm going to talk about how these visual schedules and the token boards can come together um, and how they support each other. So number one, the first then visuals should always accompany the token boards. And remember, this can be pictures or text or both, just depending on what your learner's needs are. Um, but by giving that clear visual of first then, you're creating the contract um, that the learner is going to understand is how they're going to buy their reward or how they get to what they want. If they meet the requirement, they get it. And, um, you know, the more clear that is, the better. So I like to think of it this way. The more clarity and less confusion about when a paycheck is coming for me after I've done my work, the better. Um, I think of it the same way. Their then is their paycheck. And they need to understand how it's coming to them and when. Um, we want them to understand the contingency. We want them to be successful. And that's where the motivation comes from. So um, believing in the system is where you're going to get their buy-in. And number two, um, token boards can be used during each task or activity on a sequence schedule that has multiple activities. So, oh, I forgot to show this one earlier. This is one. Um, that I used to use with my child, and you know, honestly, it's coming back into play. Um, this is like a teacher hanging pocket thing. If you ever feel like you need one of these in your home, you can just Google that, and a million options will come up. I made lots of different like schedule options, and um, so if you're using one of these where we've got lots of different things we need to accomplish before we get to their big reward, you probably want to be using a token um, system for each activity with a smaller reward. Um, on my next slide, I'm gonna go into a little more detail on that, because I know that, that didn't sound super clear. Um, so if, for example, this is kind of how uh, token boards can help you along with visual schedules with transitions. So 
that list that's only had five things on it um, on that visual schedule, but that could definitely be a lot for a, a learner who's just learning to tolerate and um, participate in new skills. So by adding in the token board, um, so I see right where my mouse is, the next thing they have on their schedule is read book. Um, if I tell them, okay, it's time to read a book, what are you working for? And then we set up our first then, okay, first read book, then earn tokens for tablet. Um, then we're gonna have a clear way that this activity is gonna go. You do the things, you get the token, and then you earn your tablet. And then that activity can move over to all done or be checked off when um, tablet is earned. The next activity is gonna start when tablet ends. So anytime someone earns something, uh, by the way, that's like sort of a quantity or a, not a quantity that goes away. So things like TV, tablet, swinging, stuff like that. You wanna set a proactive time, give them an expectation about how long it's gonna be. So if I said five minutes tablet, beep, 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 the timer goes off. Um, I might be the bad guy for a little bit, but then we can earn tablet again. So the next activity on there after we book, we play. So play with toys, we'll start, we can earn the tokens, we can earn tablet again. And by having that little reward there before the ultimate reward, so at the bottom of this, it's um, I go home, which sounds like it's pretty rewarding for a child. Um, then you've got that motivation built in and it's not like, oh man, I'm not getting anything I want until, until the bottom of this schedule. It's got motivation built in during each step. Um, there we go. Um, so when you're using these, uh, these tools, the thing to keep in mind is to be clear and to be proactive. Um, like I just said about the timers, whenever you're doing a reward activity, it doesn't have a clear end to it. Um, you're gonna wanna use a kitchen timer or a phone timer, something that's gonna beep or ding, um, so that you aren't the like the only bad guy to this and it becomes more a part of the structure and the system there's a excuse me there's a cue that's independent of you that that activity is over um, you also want to use your clear wording so everything we've been talking about with the first then that is the clearest wording that you can use first laundry and dishes then tv so first what needs to be done and then what can be earned you always want to make that as clear as possible and then um, this is really important. You wanna make sure you follow through on the contract and you don't add additional demands. So if you fill up your token board, but then you ask them to do something else, what you're doing is actually losing trust that the token board gets them what they want. So you wanna make sure you always follow through on what the initial um, first then was. And then the next time uh, you have an opportunity to enter into the token situation again, then you can add new demands. But not onto that original um, contract that you guys created. Because if they stop trusting you that if they do the work, they get the stuff, then this whole the system is gonna break down. Um, and because in our field, we know that nothing goes exactly the way we plan it. Um, I do have a couple uh, troubleshooting slides of things that you know I feel like I see a lot um, when students are learning to kind of learning to go along with demands um, from adults. So if your child engages in challenging behavior while earning tokens, um, you wanna redirect them back to the task by reminding them neutrally uh, that that's how they're gonna earn what it is that they want. Um, typically at Serduli, we don't call a bunch of attention to whatever other behavior they're engaging in. So if they're running away, if they drop to the floor, if they're, um, you know, swiping the materials, anything like that. We're not gonna talk about what they're doing. We're just gonna remind them, when you're ready, we can earn tablet by, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever the task was. Um, and make sure that you're not threatening to remove tokens or you're not removing tokens, uh, because those have already been earned for doing something good. So we don't wanna, again, lose trust in the system. They already earned those, those are there, so we can get back to it when they're ready. Um, they'll be waiting and, they can finish out their board. Um, if your child isn't earning tokens quick enough, or if you just feel like you're never gonna get to the end of that board, that's a good time to make sure you're bolstering up your reinforcement with uh, other types of praise. So you can give them tokens for staying with you, for trying, for sitting, for being patient, 
for keeping safe hands, all of those things, in addition to the answers or the effort they're putting in to do whatever the work task is. Um, after they complete some token boards, you can begin to increase the demands um, by increasing the number of tokens or how many uh, responses before they get a token, that kind of thing. But if you do start to increase your demands, just make sure to do it slowly and systematically. Don't go from like three tokens to 10 tokens right away. because That's just too much too fast. Um, okay, what to do if my child starts work but now doesn't seem interested in earning tokens? This happens so often, but at least the, uh, the answer to this one is the simplest. Uh, just ask them again what they're earning or what they want to work for because it's likely they just changed their mind. Um, you don't have to reset the token board again. You don't have to start over. Um, all you need to do is find out what they want to work for instead and then continue your token board or replace your first then um, with the appropriate options. 